Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Corona Watch on a given Monday morning. That's all there is to watch right now. And we're trying to explore it from one on one side of the globe to the other. Um, this morning, we want to talk about Africa because Africa has oil and gas that has been affected. And that in turn will affect its, um, its, its many startup companies and startup economies. And for this discussion, we have a fellow who is well trained and well expressed in this who has written uh, books about it, bestseller books on Amazon, um, and a number of articles, and who has had a lot of school um, and experience with oil and gas in Africa. And that's N.J. Ayuk. Hi, N.J., nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Nice to talk to you. I hope you guys are safe out there. Yeah, well, everybody has to stay safe now, because the probability is a good part of the globe is going to get this virus, sorry to say. Anyway, I wanted to talk about that's, Africa. That's good. Now, you wrote, you wrote a book um, about oil and gas in Africa, and uh, you spoke about how the U.S. had not kept up with Russia and uh, was it China in terms of investing in oil and gas. Let's just discuss quickly that book. It came out in October last year. It, it was a bestseller on Amazon. Billions of play it was. So can you talk about oil and gas as we went into uh, the coronavirus crisis, which um, – it was only a month or two after your book came out. Yes, I think the Africa oil and gas market had been had been very, very exotic. One of some of the biggest discoveries in Africa were done by American oil and gas companies. And not just to say the big companies, but it was everyday Americans from Louisiana, Oklahoma, um, Houston, Dallas to Set out the distant shores and the and and the heat gold in in Africa, but you see a steady decline in in that. And I think some of it came with the American shale revolution. That American shale revolution had done so well. So, take for example, in 2009, America was producing about eight to eight million barrels of oil a day. Today, the United States is the largest producer of oil and gas with about 13 million. I was lucky to, to be on the technical team at OPEC when they were discussing the price war. And while introducing into those negotiations, I think the American revolu um, revolution ha has really gotten the Russians scared and the, the Saudis. And so they decided to get the price war, which is really affecting the American oil and gas industry and also affecting the African oil and gas industry right now. And then you get coronavirus, so you got these twin, these twin evils are really um, hurting um, commerce, and especially small businesses, startup companies that are really trying to find different foreign to see how they can make they can make a living in this industry. Yeah. Well, how how important is uh, oil and gas um, to uh, startup companies and to the startup industries and and countries for that matter in Africa? It is so important, you know. I I always I always um, say this word um, in a lot of speeches I do around the world with a lot of young people, a lot of startups. I tell them, if you want to start a new app, you want to have a new startup, go to Africa because you can see a lot of the new problems. A lot of the problems you see, you 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 use your ingenuity to create new solutions. And those solutions are going to target the rest of the world because that's where you are. So the oil and gas industry is so important because right now it's not about manpower, it's automation, it's technology. It's going to be driven in that fashion. And the technology is going to be the next big game in oil and gas, and especially in Africa, which is needed. So think about it right now. 650 million out of 1 billion Africans. 650 million do not have any access to any kind of power, electricity, or that matter. So imagine if you can create something by being a startup with technology to really drive that, that there. That is a billion, 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 billion at play. That is exactly where, where we see this market going with a lot of information, with a lot of new things to be done. And the oil industry is that driver of growth because most of the states get their income from oil and they're ready to pay. 
So what we have here uh, as of the time of your book and maybe e even into December was a uh, great opportunities in uh, Africa. Um, and oil was central in all of that. Africa was the last great business frontier, it sounds like, in terms of the continents. Um, and there were all kinds of uh, you know, positive prospects. So now at the same time, the coronavirus uh, got, um, you know, got, got global. Uh, the, the Saudis had an argument with Russia and they drove the price of oil down where it is still today. How does that reduction from, I, I don't remember where it started, $50, $60 a barrel to now in the 20s, um, how does that affect um, these countries that are trying to start up these industries and businesses in, uh, in Africa? Wouldn't that be a good thing for them, cheap oil? It, 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 it is not, um, because what is really important is stable oil. If you have stability in the market, it's very, very good for the startup countries because you think about it, the cost of investing, the cost of starting up, it's sometimes it can be too high, and, it, and when you look at the risk, the, exposure and the, the risk you have to take, some companies might just say, no, it's not worth it. But also, you have to look at most African countries are actually, actually consumer nations. If you are going to consume, you want low oil. If you are going to produce, you want high oil. So we believe that when you have a stable market, it really makes, it really makes sense for them. But also, it gives us a new chance to really look at the oil and gas market in you know, from a bigger scope. In the area of climate change, you cannot just be all about oil. You've also got to look about gas. You've got to look about new clean technologies or renewables. You've got to find the whole energy mix. So all is not finished. So even when there's this crisis, you are always going to survive. And I think that is where we really see a lot of big opportunities that no matter what happens, everyday people can survive because it's not about the big companies, the big multinationals. They have a role to play and thank God, you know, mom and dad and all of them, the lot of big companies. But today, we want you to see small companies growing up and making sure that we can have the, the next Amazon and the next Facebook and the next Instagram and the next new, new technologies and new companies that are really going to provide solutions in this continent, come out of the continent because there is, they are working together with Americans. It's a big, big opportunity for us. I was lucky to go to school in America, and I know what American education and American ingenuity can do. It, it works for me, and I think it can work for a lot more other Africans. Now, let's let's talk about you for a minute, if you don't mind, NJ. <clears throat> you have you have University of Maryland. You have a graduate degree at uh, New York Technology. Um, you have uh, you've been associated with a lot of international organizations. Um, you have you have written obviously written a lot about oil and gas in Africa. Um, I take it that you are one of the leaders in oil and gas in Africa, and in the subjects we just discussed, you are a voice uh, in the development of Africa. Am I right about that? Yes, um, you 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 very you very very kind. I think I believe in what uh, Thomas Jefferson's mom told him. He said, "Be useful." So I think I have a chance to be useful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that that's, that sort of sets the stage for our discussion today, NJ. Um, so at uh, December, January, all of a sudden, a new element on the world stage, a new element in the national and global markets, uh, coronavirus. <clears throat> now, coronavirus uh, at first was uh, limited to China, uh, and then little by little it became clear that that was not – you know, going to last very long. It was going to go all over the place. And the uh, World Health Organization began making noises like, yes, maybe this is a pandemic. And ultimately, it got to Africa. Uh, and the concern in Africa was the health infrastructure was insufficient uh, to carry a significant number of cases. Um, so tell us how, uh, how coronavirus is doing, so to speak, in Africa and where, uh, and how is it affecting business in general? I think it is affecting businesses in general around Africa. The continent is seeing, I think, about more than a dozen countries are going to have a shutdown. I was in um, Equatorial Guinea, and the day I left, it had a shutdown. I went to Nigeria for a speech. The day I left, it had a shutdown. And I came to South Africa, 
where my family lives. And right now, the press just announced it's going to be shut down from from uh, from uh, Thursday. So I think the taking very drastic measures. I think one of the one of the key benefits of uh, actually there's no benefit of Corona, but for Africa being the last story where the virus is now attacking, is that we have seen the um, the mistakes of many other nations. And we can see some lessons learned. So I think leadership is saying, listen, attack this issue very strong, have the right kind of quarantine, self-isolation, have the shutdown, and it might be painful for 14 to 21 days, but it would it would save a lot of lives because right now, with Africa not having a lot of infrastructure, health infrastructure and everything, we don't want to be the burden of the world. We don't want to be the ones that are begging all the time. And I think that is really something that we have to look at. Look at Italy. They have, uh, you know, universal health care, some of the best medical facilities, but they're getting hit. So we thought maybe shutting down and containing this and really eradicating this in a very fast, in, in a fast track a manner might be good. But when it comes to the business community, yes, business is hurt. I think a lot of us who work in business, Think about it. I have people working offshore, oil and gas, in a lot of platforms offshore. They can't even come because airplanes can't move. You can't retake people. Helicopters, everything has been shut down. So you have people who are working 28 days, then go back to Louisiana, Alabama, Hawaii, or New York. They would have to be in there for 60 days nonstop. And you have that going on and on and on and on. And so it's, 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 it's Raise new wealth, but we have to also look at the opportunity in this. I think my generation is sometimes a little bit spoiled, and I, and I know it's people my age that complain about shutdown. But I think when I think about my father and grandfather and some of the grandfathers and fathers I met in America, they fought World War II. That was a shutdown, and it was very difficult. They put lives at risk. They, they went to Vietnam, they went to Korea. And some of our friends even went to the Gulf to fight. That was, that was it. So if we can be patient and sit at home and be quarantined or self-isolation for 14 days to be a very dangerous virus that hurts, that hurts our seniors more, I think it's worth doing. Uh, um, you're a lawyer, and so you'd be um, – I, I take it that you support the, uh, the shutdown, support the isolation orders uh, and the quarantine orders. Um, but, but the uh, question I have is, uh, there's a number of countries involved, there's a number of countries that have issued shutdown orders in Africa, uh, as there are a number of states that have issued shutdown orders in the U.S., and not all, the, not all of them are the same, not all of the people in those countries react the same. So from a legal point of view, country to country, um, you know, I'm, and I'm speaking about your law background now, um, and are these orders being enforced? Are people listening? Is the gov are the governments involved taking action to enforce enforce these orders? You know, I, 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 one thing I learned this state about being a country lawyer, so you, tr you try to be humble on uh, giving legal advice, but what, what you looking at? That governments are enforcing it. People are taking it serious because they're seeing what has happened in the West. You've seen what has happened in China. You've seen what has happened to business. For one, I am people are taking it very serious. I mean, before even the shutdown, there was some self quarantine. But then you have you have you have to, uh, you have some people who decided to go out there and party and not respect some of the safety rules. But it's also the other thing also that we I have advised most states is to ensure that the basic freedoms, people's human rights and people's civil liberties are not overtly infringed on porn when it comes to the shutdowns because it is, it, we, we walk in a fine line which in the sense of coronavirus in basically infringing on all kind of civil liberties. So they, um, to the credit of some of the government, they have actually reached out for clear guidelines not to infringe on civil liberties. But it's also, an, it's also a moral appeal to people to really know that we are in some, we, we are in facing some uncharted water. I just told you about a lot of young men and women who are working offshore oil and gas. 
that means that them going home in 28 days, they would have to be for 60 days. So we all have to chip in. We all have to be part of this. And it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but we all have to know that the end of it is going to be good for, it's going to be good for us. But government has, governments have to be very warned. They have to pay a lot of attention not to infringe on people's civil liberty because it is not right and we shouldn't. The Africa that we want should not be that Africa that, in, that we are allowing stuff because we are violating human rights in the process mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And Jay, you're more than an oil and gas leader. You're a leader in general, may I say. Um, you know, a, a few days ago, there was a story on uh, Lagos uh, and Ebola uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, La Lagos, I mean, I don't think people in this country realize how, how populated some of these cities are. Lagos, I think, was 8 21 million, million people. people. 21 million people. 21, oh, uh, 21 million people right now. And the, the story of Ebola and Lagos is very interesting because it, it got from a smaller city, it got into Lagos. And had it had it, um, had it expanded from Lagos, had it gone anywhere in the world, and, and it could have. Lagos is an international hub at that size. Uh, it would have been a global epidemic. But somehow they stopped it in Lagos. Are you familiar with what happened? Yes, I am. I think the the, the good news is that this this comes with some of the basics which I think even American society could learn from Africa. In some places, when you put education at the top. No matter what happens, people, they might not have all the means, but when they have that education, they would know how to do some things right. They looked at it, it, the Nigerian teaching hospitals have been well trained, a lot of really um, educated doctors. Some of them were lucky to go to school in the United States and Great Britain and Germany. They were back, they're back in the African Nigeria working, and they were quick to intervene and really engage in very good public health. Um, um, training and they stop Ebola from spreading. And I think I actually see the difference in Nigeria when I went there with how we were all checked for Corona. They had five minutes testing. I mean, you, you don't even see that in the United States. They could test for five minutes and could quickly segregate and quarantine people who, who had who had symptoms. And they were very professional. And I think from Having had the experience of dealing with these disasters in the past, they are very, very, very prepared. And I think those are the, some of the good things which I think that when you look, when you when you in Hawaii or anywhere in the United States, you could actually look at some good things coming out of Africa and think about it. Let me not switch you a little bit into technology. Some of the best case systems when you look at this called Impesa, M P E S A. Mobile money pay system. It works very in Africa, out of Kenya, and it works so well. So sometimes we go to the States, we go to Europe, we're like, these guys are so behind when it comes to mobile money and, and payments with security and everything. So <laughs> there are some good things to look at, to look at there. Because, I mean, think about it. Grandma is in the village, you don't have bank accounts. So you, you're looking at 1 billion people, only about, only about um, 160 million, according to the World Bank data, have bank accounts. Now, most people, their bank account is on their phones. They use their phones as their bank, as their, as their bank payment to, to, do, to have any transaction because they're moving in a far more cashless society. And I think we are, we are you've seen a lot of that opportunity. That's why you see some of the guys in Silicon Valley, most of them spending a lot of time around African cities looking at new things to understand communities and say, we can really develop programs and projects for the future. And, and I think one of the key things we have seen is always been really important, even with healthcare, we have to look at things of the future. We can't just be stuck with today. And I think Africa offers that challenges, those challenges, they hope, but also the people that are vibrant, that know they can be something and they can defy the odds. That's really what makes it, makes it unique. Yeah, here, here. So uh, can you give us a snapshot of how things are doing? In other words, uh, I don't think it was reported early on that there were cases in Africa. And then, of course, everybody knew that there would ultimately be cases everywhere. <clears throat> but uh, what's the status of those cases? How many cases are we talking about? Where is it popping up? Um, and how successful is the, uh, is the containment? It's popping up in South Africa. There's, there are 400 cases 
Right now, I have a friend of mine who got tested positive for the virus. And so South Africa is doing a shutdown. Cameroon has about 100 cases, and they are also going to do a shutdown. Equatorial Guinea has about six cases. They're going to do a shutdown. Senegal has about 200. Nigeria has less than 20. So it's, it, it's the numbers are small, which is good. So it's really important to contain it quickly and move and take drastic measures. But it's also an issue of leadership. I think. What we have learned is that in times of this crisis, we need leadership to be able to look at the population and say, we are all in this together. You know, so maybe sometimes you might have to stay away from grand grandpa or grandma a little bit, but sometimes we all just have to wash our hands even if we don't have a bowl on. And I think the cases are popping up. We have we are receiving a lot of support from the United States from uh, Europe, from the World Health Organization. But sometimes the lack of infrastructure is also a problem. Some, some, some communities are building mobile, mobile support centers to really support those who really need help. And we're hoping that with the, with the lockdowns, we might be able to contain it. And we also have to, we just have to be disciplined. We have to try to be useful. And that, I think that would really help us to beat this crisis because it's global. It's not just a Chinese problem or an American problem, problem or European problem. Yes, it's, it's an African problem as well, and we, we, we are part of that problem. Yeah. Well, do you have any thoughts about the American solution or maybe the American delay in a solution? I think, you know, America is a unique country. Um, the, there, is, there is nothing like America. I think sometimes, you know, um, we we always I always make fun of my friends. I say when Americans look at solutions, you get in the room, you know Americans are there. They either loud, they they boisterous, and sometimes they fat. But when you look at uh, when you look at the way the United has responded, I give a lot of credit to the governors. They have really been at the front line. The mayors they are really trying to look at because these people work every day. With the communities, the federal government in the United States, which I think a lot of people expected them to do more, they're waking up. There is a lot of things which you're looking with your Congress going to put about, um, you know, about two or three trillion dollars with the market and everything. But at the end of the day, it's not just all about money. It's about really responding to these things and really seeing how you can take some decisive action, educate people, but right from the top. Sometimes you need to send a message that really calms down a shaking nation. The American people are shaking because they've never seen that. They need to see leadership from the top. They need to see spokespeople. And it is time for people to come together and really say, we are American. We can be this. This is the country that puts people on the moon. This is the country that, 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 that saves Europe from, from the Nazis. This is the country that... Turn, turn, turn itself around and beat the evils of segregation and had a more free society. So there's nothing I don't think the Americans can beat. I think if there's one country I never bet against is that it's America. Well, the two <laughs> friends who gave me the best education is in the world. So I, I've never been worried. I think America knows how to fix itself. They always find a way to get it right. And anybody who bets against America... It's a fool at during the day and it's a fool at night because you never <laughs> bet against America. <laughs> thank, thank you, Renche. Um, I just, you know, something you mentioned, in fact, in, in many things you said here today, it suggests that uh, the leaders uh, are important, obviously. Uh, make yourself useful from Jefferson. That's very important. But, you know, it seems like this may be an opportunity for countries and leaders uh, and people uh, to come together. And I'd like to know your thoughts about whether that is or could uh, or will happen in Africa. Because a lot of the countries in Africa are not necessarily tied together very well. Will this improve the bonds among them? I think it, 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 it has. It is improving the bonds because a lot of them, because of the infrastructure gaps and shortage in health and facilities, they are having more conversations and more communication than I've ever seen. They are really reaching out to one another and say, how are you doing this? 
or what are you doing? And I think those lines of communication have, uh, have opened. And I think it, there is now going against even barriers that existed where people like either they had civil wars or they had political crisis um, with, with one another. Now they're actually talking together. And I think, you know, when you sit on the table, there's nothing you can't fix when you're on the table. And I think they are getting the table. They are more interconnected, more, more connected. And one of the things I've got to be really proud about Africa is that we have not, we have not stereotyped anybody. You know, most of the corona cases, the first 200 cases that came around the continent, they came from Europe and China. It, was, it wasn't Africans. It was European tourists and European migrant workers that were coming in to work on high-profile jobs, whether like as peace corps or working as teachers that came in corona. And this not been stereotyped. And I think that's, 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 you know, your heart beats for joy when you see that because what is even, it's always easy is to turn to the least, to, the, to, the, to appeal to the least feelings among us. So why it has been good for us, because we have been a lot of solidarity and we're helping one another and reaching out to one another. We're calling people that we didn't even talk to for a while. We only talk to them on birthdays and, 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 and everything. But also, we are reaching out to our, to our European colleagues. I mean, my firm, we donated $50,000 to the city of Berlin because during difficult times in the past, they supported us. And I, we are doing a lot of charity work, not just within Africa, but also with American cities um, because they supported us. I mean, heck, I wouldn't be here without America or American cities. They, 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 took, they took me and they gave me one of the best educations in the world. They trained me, they showed me how to be a man and live life. So when America is in crisis, we're in crisis, and we have to support them. And I think that is what this has really shocking, is that taking us back to our roots and saying we are in this together, because this crisis can erase us as a people if we are not careful. And it's going to change our relationships going forward because going forward, we are going to have to think about creating opportunities, finding cures, thinking about the future. And this is really where the tech community comes in. They really have to think about the future so that they can see these things coming and stop it because the human race is a challenge for the human race. And we, we can do better. And this generation, with all the technology and all the gifts we have, if they can big things like this and think about this in future, then, we, then we're missing the point. NJ Ayuk, um, a leading light in Africa, uh, a statement of Africa's future. Uh, and when we get through with coronavirus, and I hope that soon, soon we'll hear more about him, we'll read about him. Thank you so much, NJ. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. And uh, I haven't been to, to Hawaii in 15 years, and I promise I'll come back with my family. All right. Deal. Thank you so much. You bet.